نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمد عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد مبارك صلى الله عليه وسلم سلام وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Today, of course, is the 11th of Muharram, and you know, last week we were talking about some of the virtues of Imam Hussein al -Salam. And of course, you know, sometimes you have certain incidences within a time period that overwhelms everything else that happened at that time. You know, and if you look at Karbala, that is one of those incidences. You know, many things happened in Muharram, but uh, when you compare those things, and actually many of those things that happened in Muharram also point towards Karbala, or some aspect of Karbala. You know, again, when we look at the status of Imam Hussein al Islam, you know, if no one knows anything else, if all you know is that this is the grandson of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi that this is the beloved grandson of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we shouldn't need to know anything else I mean that should be enough but unfortunately for many of us it's not so this is the, also the grandson one of the grandsons you know the both of the grandsons Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain Alayhi Wasallam you know for whom Rasulullah Sallallahu said that they are the leaders of the youth of Jannah they are the leaders of the youth of paradise. So if our objective or if our goal in this life is to please Allah, and Jannah is the place where those who have pleased Allah will be, then we need to follow our leader. You know, for us, we have no guarantees. You know, whether we'll go to paradise or we'll go to hell. There's no guarantee. And in our minds we have this concept that, oh, if we do all these good things, then we'll end up in paradise. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reserves to right to reject all of those good things. And when we look at Imam Hussain al Islam, this is someone who is guaranteed paradise. And not just any position in paradise, but being a leader in paradise. This is the one who has been certified by none other than Rasulullah as the leader of paradise. Or as a leader of those who will enter paradise. So if we wish to be in that company in the hereafter, then we need to make ourselves part of that company in this world. So if we can't be with him physically, then we need to be with him spiritually. Our royalty, our admiration, and above all, our love should be with Him. And so that anyone who opposes Him, then we should also oppose Him. Now there's a saying in the, in the uh, comic world that 
you know, with great with great power comes great responsibility, which is true. You know, if somebody is placed in a certain position of authority, then the responsibilities also increase. And we see that even in, you know, in the worldly aspects of things. The responsibilities of, you know, of a common worker in a factory are not the same as those who's man who are managing the factory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world as a reflection of what is to come, so it makes it easier for us to understand these things. Otherwise, he could have made the two worlds completely separate. But he did this for, for our good, so that we have some comprehension of what is to come. Makes it easier to understand what we need to do. And so, if Imam Hussein al-Islam is given this responsibility, this position rather, that he is the leader of the youth of Jannah, then we know that his position, his status, his responsibilities are also great. And what he's going to do will also be great according to that status. So when we look at this, even what we talked a little bit about last week, you know, when we talked about Imam Hussein al Islam sitting on the back of Rasulullah Sassam when Rasulullah Sassam is in, is, is, is in Sajda. I mean, this is something that, you know, for the Muslims, for most Muslims, this is common knowledge that he sat on the back of, him, of, of his grandfather as Rasulullah Sassam is making Sajda, leading the Salat. And Rasulullah Sassam lengthens the Salat, the Sajda. What's well, not common knowledge for most of us, or what we don't ponder over or don't know. One is that even if you look, because you know you have these narrations, you, know, you look at Bukhari and Muslim, you have general, you have certain narrations that are sort of general. Then you have to look the Shara as, as to the explanations, and then you find other narrations that give you more detail as to what that narration, uh, what other things were associated with that incident. So if we look at this, narration where Imam Hussein al-Islam is sitting on the back of his grandfather and the Rasulullah Sussam lengthens the Salat and when he was asked later why he lay he said I did not I did not want to disturb Hussein I wanted his desires to be fulfilled I mean it, it was lengthened to such an extent that the companions of Rasulullah Sussam, several of them, they stood, they got up from the sajda and looked as to what's going on because in their mind they're thinking that maybe Allah SWT has called him back. <clears throat> One interesting point even here, their getting up from the sajda and looking did not break their salat. You know, if a regular imam is reading the salat and somebody, you know, starts wondering why is he making it so long and he, get, he gets up from the sajda and says, ah, oh, you know, something's going on, he breaks his salat. Yet those praying behind the Rasulullah so some, because of their intention, because their focus did not go away. You know, Rasulullah so some said, pray as you see me pray. Make salat like the way you see me make salat. <coughs> So what are they doing? They're looking at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Doesn't break their salat. So none of them had to say, oh, we got to start our salat over again. No. Salat continued. But the lesser known detail about this is that if you ask those companions, how many tasbih did they make? You know, normally when the, the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has ordered the Imam that when he leaves the salat, don't lengthen the sajda or the ruku or any aspect of the salat to, to such an extent that you become a burden on those following you. You know, three, five, seven. Don't really go beyond this. You know? And yet the companions, they said that they, 
They counted 72 Subhana Rabbi Al Ala. Not 71, and not 73, 72. And if you think about that, how many people that he, did Imam Hussein al Islam leave with when he left Makkah to go towards Kufa? 72. So when the quota was full, he, he got off. Quota's full, that's all he needs. He's fine. He's good to go. You know, like when we talked about Omar radiallahu when Omar radiallahu becomes Muslim, when he accepted Islam, Allah subhanahu wa revealed verse 64 of Surah Anfal. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, hasbuk Allah, wa man ittaba'aka min al-mu'mineen. That, O Prophet, enough for you is Allah, and those who follow you from amongst the believers. These are enough for you. If anyone else comes in, you know, it's like, you know, it's just simply added gravy. And at that time, according to most scholars, there were 40. Omar Radin was the 40th. The response is enough. Imam Hussein al Islam, 72. He said, that's enough. Time to go. But the more interesting aspect of this is that Rasulullah is in the state of Salat. Not just Salat, but he is leading the Jamaat. He is the Imam of the Jamaat. And he changes the structure of the Salat so that Imam Hussein al-Islam will not be disturbed. And yet when we look at what happened in Karbala, those who claim to be the followers of Rasulullah did not even have the decency that they should not disturb Hussein al-Islam in the state of Salat, when Hussein is in Salat. No. The Rasulullah in the state of Salat did not disturb Hussein when, he was, when Hussein is out of Salat. And yet all of these forces of Yazid, all of whom claim to, claim to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. All of them in their salat are saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. So Allah send your blessings upon Muhammad and on the family of Muhammad. So those making these declarations with their tongue did not have the decency that they should not disturb him in the state of Salat. When we look at the time that Imam Hussein al-Islam is martyred, <coughs> That morning, on the Ash day of Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram, he led those with him in Fajr. And then somewhere later that morning, mid-morning or so, the fighting starts. And initially those friends who had come with Imam Hussain al-Islam, they go out as a group. Now, what are 25, 26 people going to do against 22,000? And eventually, not, not very long, they're all martyred. Imam Hussein al-Islam rides forward and he, and he makes, you know, he'd, he'd given many khutbah or sermons before them, before this, these forces over the past few days. Now he, he comes and delivers one more. And he asks, he says, is there anyone from, uh, that will help the, uh, the family of Rasulullah Sussam in their hour of need? And this is when Hur, along with his sons, comes riding over. 
ask forgiveness from Imam Hussein al Islam and ask him that, you know, everything that, that I was the wretched one who came against you the fir first. So now if I give my life for you, will Allah forgive me? And Imam Hussein al Islam gives him the guarantee that on the day of judgment, he says, you have come to me at the time when I have nothing to offer you. You know, the hospitality of Quraysh was famous, but the hospitality of Banu Hashim was something totally different. He says, you have come to me at a time when I have nothing to offer you. And so on the day of judgment, I will have you drink first from the hawd of my grandfather, from the hawd of Gautha. The, the, the pool of Gautha. After which whoever drinks from that will not be thirsty again. So I'll have you drink first before I drink. And so then her, along with his sons, also falls among the martyrs. Of course he wasn't hungry and thirsty for three days like all the rest of them had been. So he was able to take out a few more. But still, what are, what are a handful, what, what's even a hundred or a couple of hundred people going to do against 22,000? And if someone wants to argue, you know, you know there weren't 22,000, you know, the minimum anybody talks about are at least 5,000. What's 5,000 5, versus 72? Still. Now the family starts coming out, one by one. The brothers of Imam Hussein al-Islam, the sons of Ali, the Radiyallahu Same father, different mothers. They come, one by one, and they're martyred. And Imam Hussein al-Islam, he rides out, he picks them up, brings them back to the tents. Next one, next one. Then the sons of, of, or the nephews of Imam Hussein al-Islam, the sons of Imam Hassan al-Islam, the four of them who were there with him one by one. And one by one Imam Hussein al-Islam rides out, picks up their blessed bodies and brings them back. His other nephews, the sons of his sister, who were very young at that time. At the most, they were in their teens, early teens. <coughs> and these aren't people who are going to fight, you know, because, you know, they're being forced to fight. These are people who are eagerly giving their lives to protect the honor and the blood of Imam Hussein. <laughs> and when he tries to stop any of them, they say, don't refuse us this privilege. And many of them also say that if we don't, you know, if we are if we are prevented from this privilege, then what face will we show to Rasulullah? <laughs> when the six-month-old son Ali Aswar. When he's martyred, while he's in the hands of Imam Hussein, of his father, Imam Hussein al Islam, and then an arrow goes through his neck and the blood pours down onto his father's beard. He's the only one that he brought back and he buried him.
finally, after the three sons of Imam Hussein Islam are also martyred and everyone is gone and there's no one, well, the two sons that were there, three sons that were there, Imam Zain al Abidin <coughs> was ill, you know, real high fever to the extent so weak that he could not even stand. Even he wanted to go and fight. But for him, Alasmanta chose him to continue the mission later on. So even afterwards, when Benu, when the, when Shimmer wanted to kill him, Alasmanta changed the situation to where they could not kill him. Alasmanta could have changed the situation where they could not kill Imam Hussein He could have caused it to rain. He could have caused Mana and, Sal Mana and Salwa to come down like he did for Bani Israel. He could have done all of these things. But he didn't. For us to try to understand the status of Hussein. When Allah Subhanahu wa says, وَبَشِّرِ well, sabirin Glad tidings to those who are patient. He's giving us an example of true patience. You know, we think, oh, you know, I fasted all day and I didn't fight with anybody today, so I've been patient. We have no concept of patience, of real patience. If we want to see true patience, then we see Imam Hussein al Islam and the family of Imam Hussein al Islam. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with those who are patient. Who is Allah with that we know? Who is Allah guaranteed to be with other than Rasulullah Wasallam and those connected to him? <coughs> When the angel comes down, when the angel of rain came down and started telling Rasulullah about what is going to happen in Karbala. And Rasulullah is weeping. Tears are flowing. And he says, I can't help this. This is before he's, this even happens. But Rasulullah could have simply asked, Allah, Allah, remove this test from Hussein. But he did not. He said, oh Allah, give them patience. You know, just like, you know, when someone's kid is in school and the kid tells the parents, oh, I got a test tomorrow. The parents don't say, oh, well, you know, let's pray that the test get canceled. No. The good parents, they pray, oh Allah, make him pass this test. When the Rasulullah tells his daughter, the mother of Imam Hussain al-Islam, the leader of the women of Jannah, Bibi Fatima salamu alayhi. When he tells his son-in-law and his cousin and his brother, Sayyidina Ali, Karamallahu wajh. Neither one of them says, oh Allah, you know, remove this from him. No, they say, oh Allah, make him patient when this happens. Give him sabr. <coughs> he is the example of patience, of true patience. He is fulfilling the responsibility of the position that he has been given by Allah. He is upholding the honor of his name that was given to him by Rasulullah. But when he buries Mama Ali Asbar, and then he comes out and he fights, he starts fighting himself. 
and he's riding the mule of, of Rasulullah. So some dun dun. That is six, 50 years later. Mule's lifespan normally is not that long, not 50 years. Even the goat that Rasulullah placed his blessed hand on and she started giving milk. The goat of Umm Muhammad, radiallahu She lived decades after that. He rides out. They realize after a few, after several of them have been cut to pieces by him. And they cannot fight him. So they start shooting arrows. <coughs> and when he realizes, you know, he, he led Fajr, the whole group, and then he led the Dhuhr as Salat al Khawf with the family. And now is the time for Asr. So he gets off of his horse. And in the condition of Salat, of Asr, and in the condition of Sajda, because he starts making his Salat. And this is when they come, and Shimmer comes and he cuts his head. His blessed head, as he's saying Allahu Akbar, Shimon is saying Allahu Akbar as he's doing this. You know, Shimon is just not, Shimon is not a nobody. He's a scholar among them. He used to lead Fajr Salat in the masjid. He didn't just make Salat, he led it. Allah SWT has already mentioned this in the Quran. And he says, Wal Asr. What is the need to swear by Asr? Inna li insana lafi khusr. Verily, truly, mankind is destroyed, he is lost. You know, when you draw an analogy to something, you don't need to specify all of the things. When I say, oh, you know, I don't have to say that he is very brave like a lion. I can simply say he's a lion and everybody understands what I mean. It's just language. If I look at the statement of wal asr, and if I want to extend it out, like if I say, oh, he's a lion, or if I want to extend it out, say, oh, he's brave like a lion. So if I want to extend it out, what does it mean? The response says, I swear by the time that, it, that Hussein will be martyred. Allah is swearing by the time that they will martyr Imam Hussein, that all of them are destroyed. All of mankind, For this action is destroyed. Then he gives the exception. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ Again, sabr. Except those who have iman, who love Allah and His Messenger, وسلم, above everything else. And therefore they love those who are loved by Allah and His Messenger. So they have Iman, and then they act upon that Iman. Not simply lip service, but now they act upon it. And they follow the path of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And they stand up for the truth, against falsehood and against all these oppressive leaders. And then they are patient with whatever comes. Time's up. Now
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. Inshallah, I'll stop here today. We'll continue next week. It's a subject that never ends. So we'll continue next week, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, His family, His companions, and all of those who they love, inshallah.